Bienvenidos a otra conferencia del ciclo de conferencias de ética, legislación y profesión. Hoy tenemos a Bastian Gary, activista en una serie larga de proyectos de software libre. Y nos dará la conferencia en inglés, pero con un acento francés, porque él es de París. Eh, en general se le entiende bastante bien, así que espero que os guste. Venga, muchas gracias. Hi everyone. Um, so can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, I've been uh, smiling at Samé, but I, I didn't understand a single word. But uh, this is just to show the, the pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Bastian Gary. Uh, I hope it's going to be an open-ended uh, discussion. Uh, my English is uh, not very good, so I will speak slowly. I hope everyone understands. And I don't care how bad your English is. I just care about uh, your questions. And uh, Spanish questions are welcome. So really feel free to ask your question in Spanish. Uh, raise your hands and uh, someone will uh, translate. Um, the title of my talk is not very modest, as if I could uh, predict the future, uh, but it's more about some collective brainstorming that I hope we're going to have and that I hope I will make you work on tonight. See, what is the future of uh, activism? And uh, my point is that we have to look in the past. Very simple. You know, this is a, a very common idea that you have to know history not to repeat the errors. But it's hard to know history when there is uh, no study about history. So since the activist history is very fresh, uh, we still need to study it. But before all that, a uh, quick definition. So you are an activist each time you are hacking, like you know, hacking on technology, computers, uh, software, the thing you learn to do here at the university, each time you're hacking has a purpose beyond itself. So this is a very broad uh, definition intentionally because I want activists to encompass uh, all the uh, activities that can have some social and political impact, you know? So hacking free software has a social and political and economical impact on the ecosystem of free softwares. Uh, hacking a system to make it uh, do something else has some social impact that you can even predict. Hacking a system to get some data that you're not supposed to have and spread all this data all over the world has a big social political impact and so on and so on. This is very simple a definition of what is an uh, activist. So, <clears throat> the point is, uh, what is this history about hacktivism? Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there are many, many experts of everything on the television. Everyone is an expert on something, and I won't pretend to be an expert on anything. Uh, if I have some expertise, it's just about my own life. and. Uh, so I will be an expert of my own life and tell you some uh, bits about my, my recent past as an activist. But before my past as an activist, uh, I'm just recovering from two uh, big events that uh, happened to me recently. Uh, the first event was uh, the birth of my daughter two years ago. And uh, usually there is this picture of a baby to make the crowd uh, love, so you're gonna have the baby uh, or the cats or whatever afterwards, <laughs> and you can uh, so do. Oh wow! So the birth of my baby two years ago and uh, a complete burnout six months ago. Okay, you're working in the IT industry, or you're gonna be working in the IT industry, so expect to have a big burnout at some point in your life, and you better be prepared for that, especially if you want to be socially and politically involved in some activism. It's going to be very tiring, and maybe you're going to burn out. So uh, because of these two big events, I realized two things. The first, the first event made me realize that we are not alone on the Earth, and uh, we are going to die. Even you, me, everyone is going to die. But there is someone uh, that we left 
uh, after us. I know it's very common to think about that, but sometimes it's good to think again. So we had to fight for future generations. We all heard about this future generation thing, but it's hard to realize until you have a baby, because your baby is your future generation. And the second event made me realize that I was being stupid for the last 15 years, because you have a burnout when you don't have any income, when you are working hard on some stuff that don't get you money enough. Okay, and we all try to survive and all, we all try to have money and we all want to align our purpose as a human being, as a hacker, and the money, right? So the burnout happens when you don't find the right balance. So we, I had to sit down and, and think, okay, how can we organize ourselves better? Okay, what are the priorities when we want to be activists and how to spend our time? What is stealing my time right now? Okay. So this this were the, the, the recent events. So I'm I'm feeling better. Thank you. And uh, uh, and I hope I will <coughs> motivate you to uh, follow that path. So Deleuze uh, had a, um, a say that. We don't think randomly, okay? Something in the outside world force us to think. And what forces me to think is that in the current state of the technology, we have all what the hippie fathers of us have been dreaming about, you know? Communication means worldwide technology to interact with each other, to discover new culture, to create new stuff. And what are we doing with it? How the world has been changing? Well, it's, we are still waiting for the good news, right? And, and I think about this every day. Like, there is a strong problem here. Like, all this technology that the, we hoped would, would save us from the nuclear war and from uh, the disaster of the humanity, well, they did nothing that we expected. So, what do we do now? The first thing is to try thinking, but there are two things that prevent us from thinking. The first one is this ideological discourse in the media about the revolutions. Okay? I think even you, like if you think about 10 years ago when you used to think about computer science, you had maybe four or five languages and you had maybe three, four methodologies about on how to program and how to do that stuff, how many languages you have now? And how many languages are fighting to prove that they are the best? And that there is some kind of revolution behind that, okay? Who is doing some closure, for example? Functional programming, yeah? So you know you are the elite, right? Haskell. Who, who, who is brainy enough to do some uh, Haskell stuff and functional stuff, yeah? Okay, cool, so you are the, 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 and how many of you have this feeling that there are so many revolutions in the technology, in the new API and new stuff, okay? Even in the last 10 years, we can realize that there is a, a, a wealth of new stuff, new, new, new. This is the most used world in the digital sphere, new, everything is new, okay? To some respect, this is true, okay? Wikipedia is quite new. It's been uh, 14 years ago. Facebook is quite new. All that stuff is quite new, but it distracts us from looking deeper into the history. And um, it distracts us from criticizing. And the third thing that prevents us from uh, thinking thoroughly is this myth of technical neutrality. You know, the, this is this metaphor of technology being either a knife, okay, I can use a knife to eat my uh, steak, or being a car. Okay, why, why would you need to learn computer science? This is, you know, a, a computer is just like a car. It's just something neutral. It's just, but do you, do you really think cars are neutral? Do you really think cars didn't change the way we live? Well, of course it did. The same, the same that computer do. And computer and technology in general is not uh, neutral. I, 
again, you, it's, uh, I'm strong opinionated on this because I want you to say, no, I disagree. Technology is neutral, okay? And that we can start discussing it uh, more thoroughly. But these two ideas that there are so many revolutions in, in IT and, uh, so many, and that IT is neutral is framing your future, okay? You're going to be worker in computer science, building stuff, building technical stuff, and you don't really have to mess with politics and with, you just have to push forward uh, the progress and this, all these revolutions. And by, may, maybe if you are pushing the right digital revolutions, you're going to be rich, okay? And maybe when you are going to be rich, you can change the world by having uh, like the Bill and Melinda, Melinda Gates Foundation, something like that. So I, I think we have to uh, keep our distance and think that nothing is so new and technology not so neutral. So that are the bits about me. So this is me, Bastien Gueye. You can reach me and send me emails there. And uh, <clears throat> you can also tweet at BZG2. This is what I've been doing for the last uh, 15 years. Um, <clears throat> 15 years ago, I'm describing uh, GNU Linux and uh, Emacs, sorry. And uh, <clears throat> 2001, I'm a philosophy uh, student, and I'm studying, I have a, a course on uh, uh, patents in medicine. So I, I get interested into patents in the software industry. And my teachers don't know anything about that because they are uh, growing, they are, the, the background is philosophy and philo philosophers are not really into computers, okay? From, from, this is a cultural thing, you cannot do anything right now. So I, I study uh, patents in, 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 and, uh, and I write an article, not on patents, but on what are the technical innovations uh, behind free software about, you know, uh, uh, versioning system, and collaboration, real-time collaboration on, on building software and so on and so on. Then I, I continue studying philosophy, working on, on Turing, and uh, I'm a host of the uh, Department of Cognitive Studies, and I start to get interested in open access. I install uh, the first ePrints uh, instance, so and I, I start being an activist because I, I spread the word about ePrints, about open access in the new universities. Um, but the Department of Cognitive Science, of Cognitive Studies was very new, and we had this large exposure because it was new and because Cognitive Studies were bringing people from different uh, departments, okay, from biology, from uh, mathematics, computer science, engineers, and, um, and philosophers, logicians. All, all, all those people were meeting there and then going back to their universities. So if you had the chance to tell them about open access, they would spread uh, the, the world in all uh, uh, universities. And um, <clears throat> in 2005, it was the first year in, in, in France where we had this law about uh, copyright and trying to prevent uh, users from downloading stuff, uh, you know, and uh, from peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, tracking users, and so on. And this is the DATSI law, and again, uh, the Ecole Normale Supérieure was the place where uh, I, I pushed and organized a conference so that people can spread uh, the word uh, all over the, 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 the other universities. And then I got interested in Emacs and Augment starting, starting to hack more. Why? Because when I wrote this article in 2001, the reception by philosophers were like, okay, this is really interesting. We didn't know about software patent, or we were not interested into that, and now we're gonna look into this. And, but the reaction from, from uh, developers were like, who is this philosopher? Come on, we, he, he, he's saying about, for example, I used uh, the, the freshmeat.org, and for those who are uh, old enough to know freshmeat, is freshmeat.net. And so I was somehow attacked by developers who were thinking, we don't need any philosophers, we don't need any sociologists, we don't need any view on what we are doing because we know what we are doing. And this is the mainstream, mainstream uh, idea still today. So I, when I discovered Emacs, I got into it more and more, and when in 2006, this was the year where I decided to, uh, to try to uh, uh, hack more and to learn more about uh, de developing 
and, uh, and to contribute more uh, on the uh, lower ground, you know, to, to bring real stuff, not just ideas. Then 2007, um, <clears throat> there was a group, again starting at the ENS, Ecole Normale Supérieure, about education, cognitive science, and computers. And the idea was, how can we use cognitive science to prove that computers are good for education? Which was a big hypothesis, right? Because uh, we wanted to demonstrate that computers were good for education through co cognitive science. And the results were kind of disappointing uh, that we have no proof, okay? All depends on the methodology, on the pedagogy, and all that stuff. That's how I got into the one laptop per child project. So how many of you know about this one laptop per child project? Or the, the project of the $100 computer? Yeah? Okay. So this project uh, started in 2005, and this is about building a computer with free software and um, uh, a, a low ecological footprint and, and, uh, and to distribute it to the developing world. And this is led by Nicolas Negroponte at the MIT. And uh, I had the chance to join the project for one year in 2008. And I started the, the, the French association working on uh, the software for education, on the translation, on bringing new pedagogical contents, and so on. And, um, <clears throat> and this is very important because uh, now it's, it's at the center of a huge worldwide community of people interested in education. There are two and a half million computers in the, in the world, XO computers from OLPC, and all this is bringing a lot of research in every country about uh, how to use computers in education. And today I encourage you to uh, read the reports from Uruguay, so Uruguay, they bought computers for one generation, one entire generation. So they have lots of research on how to manage such a project, building uh, kind of uh, you know, clusters between the Ministry of, of Transport, the Ministry of Telecommunication, and the Ministry of Education. How to let local communities appropriate uh, the Wi-Fi connection and the technology itself, and so on and so on. So 2009, I, I went to uh, Beijing and I led um, a summer school on using free software for uh, research. So what are the tools for doing uh, bibliography and uh, for writing articles? What is the, 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 the how are we gonna write articles in 10 years? And uh, all, that, all that field of, of research. 2010, I worked as uh, the first employee for Wikimedia France. And uh, together with, with Samer, we started this uh, Move Commons uh, ID. So uh, all of you are familiar with Move Commons? No? OK, so uh, all of you are familiar with Wikipedia? Yeah, all of you are awake already? Yeah, OK. So um, Wikipedia is the big, famous uh, encyclopedia. And Wikimedia is the movement uh, behind it. Who is uh, familiar with Wikimedia? Yeah, are, are you part of, of the Spanish Wikimedia movement somehow? No, not yet, okay. But you know this structure of having the movement and the projects. The projects are Wikipedia, of course, but also uh, uh, Wiki Commons for the pictures, Wiki University, all these all this, uh, different projects. Wiktionary, okay? And, uh, and Wikipedia is just the most prominent project, and the Wikimedia Foundation based in the US, is in charge of paying for the bandwidth, the servers, the infrastructure, developing MediaWiki, the software that is used. And uh, all over the world, there are chapters. So there is a big chapter in, in France, in Germany, and in, in different countries. And <clears throat> this is a very complex system of how they raise uh, the, 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 the money, but it's a mix of raising the money in their own countries for themselves, for some association, and for some others, uh, the call for, for donations is centralized on Wikipedia, goes to the Wikimedia Foundation, and is redistributed uh, through a fund dissemination committee. Okay. Anyway, this, this, is, this was uh, really important to discover all this and to discover the, the kind of activism that is behind uh, Wikipedia. Because I would say there are right now 
two planets, the one from Free Software and the one from Wikipedia. And strangely enough, there are not that many communication between the two planets. Like most Wikipedians, like in my time, like five years ago, maybe this changed, but most Wikipedians wouldn't know about the Creative Commons license. They just know it's some license here, but they wouldn't know about Laurence Lessig and the guy behind the Creative Commons project. So all of you, you know about Laurence Lessig thanks to the course you have here, but most Wikipedians, they don't. They, they just come from uh, various backgrounds and, and completely different backgrounds than the guy from Free Software who are into this history of free licenses and uh, free software. So 2011, in, in Wikimedia France, I, I organized a big conference on how to have more museums use Wikipedia and how to have a more Wikipedia page use public domain pictures from museums. So encouraging museums both to put pictures on the public domain and to change the law behind that. And there is a, there is a, a, a law called the Freedom of Panorama, which allows people to take pictures in the streets of buildings. So this law is very important, and, and I don't know if you have it in, in Spain. I know in Europe, uh, in France, we don't have it, meaning that if we take a picture in the street, we have to check whether the, the, the architect is dead more than uh, 70 years ago. Otherwise, we are not allowed to publish a picture. Okay? This is a different case than for the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower, you can take it, of course, this is more than one century ago, but the lightning in the evening, you cannot take a picture and, and put it on the web just because this is some work of art. Okay. So this was a, a, a big moment where all the Wikipedia community gathered and met big museums like Le Louvre, like uh, uh, Chateau de Versailles, and uh, we had a Wikipedian go into the Chateau de Versailles for six months, telling uh, all, the, all, the, all the people in Versailles how Wikipedia was working, and this was a, a big uh, exchange of, of knowledge. 2012, I must have been doing nothing, I guess. 2013, <laughs> well, 2012 is the year where we started in France a project about having a museum of computer science. Do you have a museum of computer science in Spain? Yes? In this building? How is it going? Good? Many visitors? Yeah? Nobody can talk, of course, okay. <laughs> but how can it go better, you know? Maybe being more central, be bigger, Oh, what do you do in the museum? Is it just about looking at computers? How interesting. Okay, so we had this nice gathering in France about what should be the next big uh, museum for computer because we don't even have a computer. You know, that's the difference. French people, they like to talk a lot about things they will have. And um, it's not yet existing, but we had a lot of interesting discussion. And what I suggested and was to have... Uh, what I call the retro programming lab, meaning that you could go into some computer and instead of just looking at it, you could program it. Okay, I have a computer from, from maybe 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago or 20 years ago and have some instruction on how to program this computer. Have workshops on how to program BASIC on some abstract, Amstrad or Atari computer from the old days. Why? I think for fun. And also to, uh, you know, to walk in the same path that our parents or, or even me or, or people from an older generation have been uh, walking through to just understand the thinking and to understand the evolution of interfaces, of languages, and what were the constraints that uh, have been achieving the computer science as we, as we know it right now. So 2013 was about um, <clears throat> crowdfunding in, in free software uh, for free software. So first I had this idea of, of starting a new company because obviously when you think about crowdfunding, you, you see the, the, the growth of the sector and you think, okay, there is money to, 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 to do here. And, um, but instead of that, what was effective is that we organized the first uh, hackathon. So what is a hackathon? Hackathon is just having some place, some sponsors, and some 
people that you put in the place, okay? First hackathon, we had 5,000 euros from, uh, no, we had two and, uh, and, 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 and 500 euros from four companies, four organizations, two organizations and, and two companies. They gave us the money, we gathered the people, and we, tell, we told the people, okay, now you can give the money to free software projects. Okay, you don't have it to do, to do it on your own, behind your computer, uh, late at night, and using your own money. You can do it using the money from the sponsor. And it was amazing. Like, all the people were like, yeah, I, I want to give the money that is not mine. And the sponsor were very happy. Yeah, of course, it's hard. They, they, they meet the people who, li who wants to give to free software, and, and they, they become friends immediately. So this is a very effective way of supporting projects, and we did, it, we did that uh, uh, one month ago again, and it was even more successful. We had more money, uh, like 4,000 euros, and we had more projects. For example, the projects who've been earning uh, the most money was Open Food Fact. Do you know this project? Open Food Fact is a huge um, uh, database uh, on f about facts on foods that you buy in, in, in the shops everywhere. So you can go online and check uh, the, the calorie, how is it been produced, what is all that. And this project earned 500 uh, euros because of the hack and all. So they were like, okay, and now it's spreading. Uh, we are spreading the world that people who need money in the free software and free project communities can gather and organize a hackathon, and you can too. And 2015, maybe I have a rest, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. So, as you can see, this is a bit chaotic, and um, uh, no doubt that I, I went into a burnout, but there is a common link, which I learned from uh, Richard Stallman and, other, and, and Walter Bender. When you know these people, there is not one day when uh, Richard Stallman is not fixing something on Emacs. He's not, you know, patching Emacs or patching some other GNU uh, software. So there is not the thing about being a guru and, uh, and keeping away from the dirty stuff, from the ground. No, they are always doing things on the ground. So. The way I see hacktivism is this idea of always doing stuff on the ground. You're not deciding. There is not this old world where you decide stuff for others to do. Okay? And the other thing is to try to build bridges. Bridges between education and free software. Between research and free software. Between the new social economy and free software through crowdfunding. You know, between uh, real-time events with people around some, some uh, common purpose, and free software. So always try to do uh, different stuff and to do it uh, together. So, <clears throat> there is not uh, much time left for thinking, okay, w when you are doing all this, like programming on uh, Emacs, chatting at 3 a.m. in the morning with uh, Samer, who says, yeah, we have to do this for move comments. Oh, by the way, I didn't describe move comments. So Move Commons is inspired by Creative Commons, and the purpose of Move Commons is to create a simple labeling system so that uh, associations and initiatives who are um, contributing to the commons, whether it be knowledge commons or ecological commons or urbanism commons, that you can spot very easily what organization is contributing to the commons. When you go on the web, you have uh, all this organization, association, and you want to volunteer for someone, but you don't know what is the real contribution to the commons. Um, so I will, I will leave uh, the commons for another uh, talk of, of, of Samer definition because he's the specialist. But Move Commons was this simple idea of, uh, okay, let's try to organize this ecosystem of association so that users uh, know where to go. The same way that they know their rights through Creative Commons, they want to know where to go with uh, Move Commons. So, the more I was uh, uh, staying on the ground and, and, and hacking uh, and, and trying to build stuff, I was, uh, um, the, the view was more and more narrow. 
You know, you know this feeling when you are debugging something. Okay, you have to abstract yourself from all of the thinking. It's a very psychological intense sensation. You have to debug this this bug, and you have to concentrate, and you have to put all these factors in your memory just to kill one bug. Okay, and then you tend to be more and more narrow-minded, which is all the purpose. You, 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 your mind is like a laser. You want to be a laser and just to kill this bug. You abstract from the environment. You can spend hours. You forget about the time. You know this feeling. Okay, but I was like, and sometimes I was, you know, breathing a bit on the Sundays. And, and, and reading stuff randomly on the web. And the more I was reading, the more I was like, okay, I thought everything was new, but nothing is new. Okay, for example, I discovered brainstorming is from the 40s. Okay, I, I was thinking all this nice, you know, methodology that we have in uh, agile development, agile stuff, this is just based on new management, uh, new programming methodology, that are really inspired by the same thing, by the same revolution, like brainstorming from Alex Osborne in, in advertising. Okay? Just break all the rules and have a different way of doing things. Same for the Memex. Who knows uh, the Memex? And Vannevar Bush. Okay. Bush, Vannevar Bush wrote an article in 1945 called As We May Think. And in 1945, he described the internet. He described this kind of big memory that we can access through a screen. Okay. After the talk, I have some uh, some 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 picture, and I will show you the the picture of of the memex. And this is really when you read this article, everything is here, like the potential for humans being to connect through the memex, and the potential for the mind to be augmented by the memex, okay? So all the discussions that we have about internet bringing people together and internet either being something that impairs the thinking, you know, Google makes us stupid, or something that augments our capabilities and empowers users to think more about different stuff and so on, it was here. So this is, the, you know, this article, when you read it, rethink uh, what, have, what you've seen as some revolution. Not Wiener. Who knows Wiener uh, by its name? Okay, he's the inventor of the cybernetic. Okay, in the 50s, cybernetic is a science of feedback and control, feedback and command. You know, this, uh, the, the thermostat. So the thermostat is something that auto-regulates, like automate. So this is because you've been shy that you don't raise your hand, right? So don't be shy, please. And in 1950, he writes something called the human use of human beings. So in old times, when we try to understand what Google, Facebook, and all these big industries are doing with our data, are we more free to communicate with people from you know, kindergarten because they found us on the Facebook? Are we more free because of that? Or are we less free because some other people are using our personal data to advertise? Are we manipulated or not? Okay. In 50, Norbert Wiener uh, wrote this, uh, this book that went very famous in the US. It's not just a book for a few specialists. It's, it's a book, the same for Claude Shannon when he wrote The Mathematical Theory of Information. This is a very technical book. But it was really, really famous in the US. It was, it was not just for the specialists. And we have to think about this to understand how young Americans that later on were, were building the internet were influenced. They were influenced by uh, the Cold War, uh, the, 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 the fear of uh, the, the ex extinction of the human race because of the nuclear war. It was in, in, in subconscious for everyone, but it was really strong. And they were influenced by people like Norbert Wiener, who said, OK, I invented cybernetics, but maybe this is the worst thing that may happen to the humanity. We have to control this, this, this thing. And he wrote another book called God and uh, Golem, uh, which, is, uh, which I, I, I'll come back later on. So who is programming using object-oriented uh, uh, language? 
Yeah, everyone. We think it's from uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. OK. So you know about the roots. But the, the, the source of inspiration is the sketchpad. Do you know the sketchpad? OK. The military guys that were um, building new interfaces and new algorithm uh, to intercept uh, missiles and so on and so on. But one of the interfaces they were building was the sketchpad. It was a screen that you could, you could draw on with some optical uh, pen. And when you draw a line on the screen, uh, a triangle, for example, so you know you've seen the demonstration on the web. It's, it's amazing. You draw a triangle, and even if you don't draw until the, 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 the real edge of the line, by some magnetism that we are used to in GIMP or other software, it will, it will stick to the edge. Okay? And then from this shape, you could uh, say, this is a pattern that I want to repeat. So the sketchpad has been influencing Alan Kay for inventing object-oriented programming because of this spatial uh, and, and classification uh, metaphor. And it has been also fluent uh, in, in, in designing the, the interfaces. And this is from like 50 years ago. So what, what we learned since then? Who knows uh, Douglas Engelbart? He passed away recently and, and all the medias were saying he invented the mouse. Okay, he invented the mouse, but uh, he was doing a lot, uh, m more, much more than that. I discovered the mother of all demos. So the mother of all demos is a demo that he did uh, online <clears throat> and uh, uh, in front of an audience to demonstrate the capabilities of uh, his computer. The, the capabilities of the computers were about organizing knowledge in a more efficient way. <laughs> and I happen to know about the mother of all demo thanks to people from the Emacs OrgMod list. So OrgMod is just this organizer that you are seeing right now. It's just a to-do list that you can fold and unfold stuff. You can add tags and, and to-do keywords and do anything. So the mother of all demos is really interesting to see because it looks like this. I know I use something very ancient and very not user-friendly, and that's something that we're not used to. But all the concept about folding, unfolding, moving uh, stuff uh, around, accessing the, the internet or the memex through a link into this kind of textual interface were uh, presented by Douglas Engelbart uh, in this. And I told you about OLPC, one laptop per child, this idea of having small portable notebooks for children. The first idea of a small portable uh, uh, you know, notebook or textbook for children with a screen was from Alan Kay in uh, 1972. Actually, he made a drawing in 1968, and, and, but he wrote an article in 1972 describing the Dyna book. And the Dyna book would be some portable computer that you could have in your pocket with a touchscreen interface and some educational software. This is 45 years ago, and, 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 and we need to think about what were the roots of this idea and how it's been spreading in the ecosystem and, and why we've been forgetting it for so long. Another influential book uh, was this uh, in the US, was this book by uh, Schumacher in uh, 1973, Small is Beautiful. The idea was that uh, we have big industries, and we have... What's happening? Is it me? I, I, I don't move anymore. <laughs> Is that we have big industries, we have big change about, and, and all these changes are supported by big state bureaucracy. But we have to fight against this and uh, find just infinitesimal and small changes, small te technological changes. This is why it's called Small is Beautiful. And all this started a new movement called Appropriate Technology, 
When I say a movement, it's because there were lots of thinkers and lots of activists. People trying to practice you know, the small and uh, is beautiful way in their home, repairing stuff. You know, all this thing that we are used to think as the uh, do-it-yourself movement. It started here, long, long time ago, okay? It's not new. So again, always think about why are we presented things as new? This is just to distract us. This is just to prevent us to look at the history of things and to, uh, uh, and to, be, to have a strong uh, criticism of what, what's happening. And again, some of you, I guess, are familiar with the, the approach of design pattern, okay? Or maybe you uh, read uh, this book about design pattern. Who is a bit familiar, even with the, the expression or the notion? Okay, this may be something that you learn uh, in computer science. Okay, and uh, but this comes from Christopher uh, uh, Alexander. He was an architect, and he's the one who brought the idea of modularity in uh, urbanism, saying we have these big giant universities, but they are not functional anymore. They, are, they have been thinking by a hierarchy with someone at the top and some executors. And this is not the right way of doing stuff. We need to do stuff in a more agile way. Okay? And we need to have uh, 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 patterns that we can reuse. Okay? If, we are, if we want to have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, places in a university for, for students who make sports, we need to think this place is not as something monolithic, but as something with small modules that we can arrange together. And this has been inspiring the computer industry and the software industry into thinking, okay, maybe modularity is better for security and functionality. And then it was better for collaboration and all that stuff. But again, so I say just connecting the dots because all these readings that I was doing were, were like all, all the things that I thought were new are actually quite old. So why I'm not aware of, of the thing? Why I'm not aware of the history? So there could be two reasons. Maybe because uh, the surrounding economy and the surrounding ideology doesn't want me to know the history. Or maybe there is no history. Maybe it's too fresh. Okay? And the truth lies uh, some, somewhere in the middle. So um, now I will come back to what I call the, the, the roots of cyber culture. Because all of you are, 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 are familiar with uh, Julian Assange. Huh? Who is not? Jul or maybe that's my English. Julian Assange, WikiLeaks. Okay. Uh, Snowden. We all he heard about this. Okay. So we know what is activism, what is cyber culture. But again, my point is that not knowing the history will make us do the same errors again and again. So what is the, the history of, of, of cyber culture? As I said, there were, just after the war, there were a few trends that are very important to understand. Kids were really frightened to, for the human race to extinct, especially in the US. There were all this science fiction, all this um, media representation that we could, we could die that maybe we were the, they were the last generation. It was really strong in the literature uh, everywhere. Another big, big trend, and it has been studied uh, quite closely, is that um, <clears throat> there was a divide between uh, the Americans. Some were saying, okay, we put a lot of money in the uh, uh, military stuff and, and lots of consortium between military and, and, and universities. Now we have to go back from that. And we have to spend less money on military stuff. And the others were like, no, we have to keep the same pace. And this is what happened. So there, there is this big uh, uh, university military uh, uh, going together and lots of funding into that direction, which was supposed to protect the US from, from the, the, the Cold War, but we, which was spreading this feeling into this generation that they were forced into some kind of life they didn't want. There was, there was the fear of being the last generation and the, the fear of this state who had very rigid view on, on, on going to the war in Vietnam and stuff like that. And, and, and being a big bureaucracy that was directing the life. I'm not a number. Remember that slogan? 
I'm not a member, comes from there. This is, I don't want to be part of this bureaucratic stuff. I don't want to be part of, of, of this organized state fear of being the last generation. But I'm, uh, at the same time, I have this fear and I can't get rid of it. And the two others and the two resistances from there were the rise of the new left. Okay, people going in the streets and saying, no, we don't want to go to Vietnam. Organizing strikes, organizing riots uh, in, in, in many cities. Like in 1967, uh, there were like 167 uh, 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 cities where police and military gears had to, uh, uh, to, to come to uh, stop the riots. So it's huge. Okay, so, and this new left was organized as a traditional uh, way of fighting, you know, uh, like, uh, like uh, unions or like a, like a political party. They, they had leaders, they had supporters, uh, they, they were using the same traditional way of funding a party and they were just having a program and do stuff like that. So this was one way of resisting. The other way was what uh, Fred Turner is, called, is calling new communalism. New communalism is uh, this giant exodus of people in the countryside build, building new communities, small communities like what we know as the hippie movement. So during the history of the US, there were between uh, the, the, the 18th century and uh, the, 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 the Second World War, there were like 600 communities, like experiments of living together, uh, either based on some religious uh, belief or not. Just communities, escaping the state, escaping this big uh, bureaucracy of the state, of taxes and stuff like that. So 600, which is big enough, but not, not giant. And for example, there is Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, a, a novelist from the 19th century who wrote a novel called Valjoie, and this is his report of living in such community. And this is very interesting because he says, okay, uh, I'm doing some gardening, I'm helping people, we are close to the earth, but I still feel like I'm just some intellectual and that I don't have my place here and so on. There is some kind of artificial feeling about trying to pretend that we are peasants. Okay. So, 600 communities. Then, during the, the decade in the 60s and the 70s, there were 15,000 communities in the US with 700 thousands of people doing these experiments of communities. So this is huge. When we, call, we speak about the hippie movement, this is not just a few people taking drugs and, and, and listening to punk and, and, and rock and roll. This is huge, like 700,000 people going into these experiments. So this is what Fred Turner called uh, the new communalism. And there is a strong divide between these two kinds of resistance. The new left is like we have to fight, we have to fight in the street, we have to gather and to be a political force and we need to be on strike and we need to denounce uh, segregation, all that stuff and, and, and to fight with the same method that we did already and with the same method that our enemies. And the others were like, well, no, the solution is not in the collective, it's in the individual and it's in the, in, in the way we can change ourselves, our soul by, you know, taking drugs, listening to music, and do stuff differently. So what is interesting is that they, both movements, they share the same feeling that there is this big military bureaucracy that is, you know, framing their lives, and they don't want that. But the first movement is like technology is part of the uh, bureaucracy. This is just a way to control us. And there are strikes in Berkeley and in other places not to have a student's number, not to let students be registered by a computer because computer is part of the evil. And new communalism is more open to the idea of using technology. And this is um, mainly thanks to someone called uh, Steve Brown, and uh, 
His biography is called From Counterculture to Cyberculture by Fred Turner. And um, <coughs> you should read this book because it, it explains everything. So for example, let's take this, this quote from uh, Mario Savio in, in Berkeley, uh, 1964. There is a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odd. Yeah. Just let me, yeah. There is a time when, when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you sick at heart, and you can't take part. So we have to break the machines. We, the machines are part of the bureaucracy. Whereas on the side of the new communalism, the trajectory is this, going from the B generation, so Kerouac, people experimenting with drugs, traveling the US, trying to break the machine from inside. And in the 60s, Steve Brandt, doing experiments in the artistic field. And this artistic field with John Cage and people like that is very open to using new technology because they feel like they are researchers and scientists and they want to experiment with uh, performances using you know, projections, sound, everything electronic. They are not afraid of that. They are integrating it in their artistic uh, way of, of uh, criticizing the society. Ken Kesey. He's uh, the father of uh, Fly Over Cuckoo's Nest. You've seen that movie with Jack Nicholson? I have a picture of the movie when, uh, okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and he's also the, the, the one who was directing, although he wouldn't say I was directing, but he was directing the Merry Prongster. And the Merry Prongster was where people traveling in the US in a bus, like a completely psych psychedelic bus, and pretending there was some kind of LSD for the US and doing the revolution by spreading ideas on Zen, Buddhism, uh, uh, sexual uh, liberation, experimentation, and all that stuff. So this is the new communal communalism, trying to change things at the individual level and uh, want, willing to, and, and accepting to bring technology into this way of changing stuff. So in 1968, Steve Brown started the Wall Earth Catalog. And this has been part of, this, of the counter and the cyber culture since then. This was just a big catalog where you, you could not buy stuff directly, but you could know where to buy stuff that you needed for your community. For example, if you need some, uh, some piece for a tractor of, of, of doing food, of growing plants, whatever, you could have this information in the Earth catalog, which was uh, encompassing catalogs for everything. Okay? I don't know if you heard about this project, about someone um, making tutorials on, on how to build a farm from A to Z. Okay. And we're like, wow, this is new because this is a TEDx talk. Oh, come on. The World Health Catalogs was already about this, about, about giving people the small tool to build the small communities that they need to make the small revolutions in themselves and around themselves at a local level. And this has been um, a, a huge uh, success. After the World Earth Catalog, they started in, in, in 85 the World Earth Electronic Link, the well. This is called the well, and this has been part of the cyber culture since the beginning. Because they were like, okay, all the communities, most of them were just uh, failures because it's so hard to be uh, a community and to have an organization, a stable organization. But there is this place with computers where we can have communities, virtual communities, where we have anonymity, where we can be all together in the same uh, hippie way that we were expecting. So the deception from the hippie movement converted itself into some big hope into the cyber uh, universe. And the well was uh, inheriting from the, from the wool Earth Catalog as a way of changing lives. And then this was the final step for integrating the technology into this idea of changing the world. Whereas the new left was still hostile about technology and so on. So integration of technology into counterculture through the new communalism uh, via the wool Earth Catalog, the well, and finally Wired. Okay? Wired, the magazine that you still read, was funded in uh, 1993 uh, by people who started also the, the, the Well and the World Health Catalog, who were hippies at the time and converted themselves to the new economy and being very libertarian and saying, yeah, we need to rush into this new economy. 
So this is how to, uh, we can understand the way a very conservative view about the economy, like that capitalism is good, uh, met with the love for technology and the hope for changing people's lives around, you know? The ideas from hippies that we need to be in peace all together, the ideas from libertarian that capitalism is the best system and it will solve everything by the auto-regulation of the market, which was also grounded on cybernetics and so on. And the idea is that technology was the real means for that. And you have Facebook, okay? A giant capitalist, capitalistic success bringing people together in hope of a revolution that will never come, okay? Because Facebook is not political, whereas those movements were political at the beginning. So, <clears throat> there was a book in France translated by the new spirit of capitalism by Adolfo uh, and Chapello. And it's very interesting, it's about why all the idea, ideas that we had in 68 in France, for example, in Mexico, have been swallowed by capitalism. And they distinguish two criticisms that happened in the time. One is the social criticism, that we, don't, we want more uh, freedom and we want more uh, equality between people. And the other one was we, the, the artistic criticism, that we, want, we don't want this society of just consumption, of marketing, this is fake. We want something authentic. And we want to come close to something more authentic. And you find um, these two kinds of criticism in the hippie movement, okay? We don't want the bureaucracy, and because this bureaucracy is just uh, uh, preventing the system to evolve in a more horizontal way, in a more egalitarian way. So this is a social criticism, and this is why they are called left. But at the same time, you have the artistic criticism, saying we want to uh, be more self-empowered. We want to uh, flourish as individuals. We want to experiment new stuff. We don't want our lives to be framed into something that is uh, predefined by the, by the government. And we want uh, authentic contact with reality and with others. So you find these two kind of criticism within the hippie movement, and uh, you can combine this with the two left that I, I, uh, and the two resistances that I distinguished, like the new left and the new communalism. And you also find that, again, into two strong metaphors. <clears throat> For Steve Jobs, computers are bicycles. This is a metaphor that he often employs, like it's a communication. With computers, you can go farther, quicker. For Alan Kay, computers are musical instruments. And he, say that he used this metaphor to explain why computer uh, computers are failing at school. You say, well, if you put a piano in a classroom, nothing will happen. We'll, you will just have, you know, p children doing random stuff on the piano, but the music is not in the piano. The music is the music, and you have to learn the music to play the piano. But, so it's some kind of instrument that allows you to uh, enact the music, but it's not the music itself. Computers are not magical instruments that will change the mind of children. You have to learn uh, how to play the computers, and you, ha you have to learn the music to learn how, uh, on how to be creative. So these two metaphors, um, the first one, Steve Jobs insists on how computers can help the social revolution, okay? bringing people close to each other. The second metaphor uh, lets us understand how to uh, accomplish the, the, the artistic revolution. Artistic in the sense that feeling more authentic, more self-empowered. Uh, and then finally, you have people mixing the two kinds of, of criticism. There is a book by Matthew Crawford uh, <clears throat> in uh, 1999, Shop Class as Soul Craft, an, inqui an Inquiry into the Value of Work. And um, its theory is that we have too many things at our disposal that makes us forget that we need to, uh, how to do these things by yourself, 
Okay? Basically, he was some thinker, some knowledge worker in a think tank, and he had this feeling he was doing fake stuff, non-authentic. So he had to go back, and he started to, to, to run a motorbike shop. And he felt like it was more authentic. He was repairing stuff for real. You know, the same, the same thing I said about Richard Stallman continuing to patch software. You have to do real stuff and meeting real people about their real needs and being in a real interaction with people when you are repairing stuff, changing their lives, bits per bits, and so on. And the title for this book is uh, inspired by uh, the title of a very famous book in the 70s by Robert Piercyk, The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, an inquiry into values. So this is kind of a trip of a father with his son going through the US and trying to tell all the people your job could be a real job if you want to hack stuff for if you want to repair the, 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 your, your uh, motorcycle by yourself. So the, the do-it-yourself movement is really inspired by all the things. And there is another, uh, <clears throat> another thinker and, 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 and uh, world change maker, which is William Morris, which is more famous as the one who started the arts and crafts movement. But in uh, 80, 1880, started to uh, do some conferences on socialism. So he was really politically engaged, and his discourse was not uh, the, the conventional uh, Marxist uh, discourse. It was more about look at how your life has been endamaged and, and, and by consumerism, by the standardization of objects around you. So what he wanted to bring is a small revolution by letting people uh, buy stuff that are handmade and that are really not artistic but uh, artisanal. And, and this comes close to things that we hear now about uh, the changing economy on, on, on do-it-yourself, on uh, 3D printing and stuff like that. So this inspiration is also very important. So finally, <clears throat> there is this, <clears throat> there is this uh, giant frame on, the, on the, when you are thinking about technology. We have to go back to philosophers and some myth uh, to, to understand what we are talking about. In Heidegger, there is this description of technology as something that is framing and limiting life, okay? As if you have tools, but the tools, are, you are prisoners from the tools, basically. And this is das Gestell, okay? I don't know how you are, there is always some funny discussions about how to translate this, but framing is a good uh, description. So meaning that you think we are, uh, uh, changing the environment for our own purpose through technology, but in fact, we are changing the perception of human, human beings because the technology is so powerful that it's, it's framing our lives, which is kind of relevant considering what we've been doing with the digital environment. This is now an environment that is controlling and framing our minds and what we want to do and we, what we can do online and what people we can meet and so on and so on. So this concept is very interesting. There is another thinker, Gilbert Simondon, a French one, which was very early into the criticism of automatism. He said there is this dream from uh, uh, technical people to automate everything, to get rid of the human from the technical loop. But there is a danger in this, and the danger is the same that the one Heidegger has been pointing to, is that you think you're controlling stuff, and you think you're controlling stuff by getting rid of the, of the human factor, but in fact, the more you get rid of it, the more it, it controls yourself. And all this goes back to the same myth that we've been talking, to, talking about in, 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 uh, for, for, for decades, for, for centuries. Prometheus, stealing the fire but uh, being punished. Okay, Frankenstein, and Frankenstein has been written in uh, 18, 18, uh, 18, 18th century, 18, by uh, uh, Marie Shelley, and the ideas came from Lord Byron, 
who was thinking about, hey, you, you should write some history about a ghost. And Lord Byron is the father of Ada Lovelace that has been doing stuff on computers. So there is a mix of people and ideas here that is interesting. And, and, <clears throat> and finally, the golem. The golem is less famous as a myth. But the, the idea is that there was a rabbin. He built a robot. When he wanted the robot to be alive, he put a note with the name of God on the note, and he put the note in the mouth of the robot. And then the robot could walk and do his stuff as a slave, as a robot should do. And when he wants the robot to go to switch off, he just take off the, the, the paper with the name of God. And one day, on, on one Friday, he forgot to take the paper back. The robot becomes completely crazy. And finally, there are two different ends for the story. Either he kills the, rabbi, the rabbin, uh, either it dies. Okay, so either the robot win, either the rabbin uh, win by controlling the robot. But it's all about the same story, about technology that's, that slips uh, away from our hands and that is controlling ourselves instead of, of letting us control it. The Platon, in Fed, so it's more than 2,000 years ago, in Fed, said that the, 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 the writing, the capacity of writing was sent as a gift, as a pharmacon, which means as a remedy to help memory. Okay? And we understand this idea very, very easily. Except that in Greek, pharmacons means both the remedy and the poison. So the ambiguity is, is lying right there at the very beginning. And uh, Derrida has made a whole career on exploring this ambiguity of the pharmacon being both the poison and the remedy. And, and Bernard Stiegler, a, a, a philosopher about technology, is still uh, uh, digging into this uh, ambiguity. But <clears throat> Plato is also famous for having criticized the writing, saying that writing should be not forbidden, but limited. Because when you read books, you think the, the, the author is not there to reply. You have this feeling that the book has some authority on you, and you are losing memory. You are saying that already. And these are kind of the same arguments that people are using against Wikipedia. There is no real distinction between you and the authors, especially because the authors are uh, several ones. There are several authors, and they are using pseudonyms. So there is not a real man-to-man -man discussion, which is the place where rationality grows. Uh, as, as Plato thinks. The second argument is that, yeah, there is a fake feeling of authority because Wikipedia presents itself as an encyclopedia. But this is fake because there is no real authority because you don't know who is writing. And, the, and last but not least is Wikipedia. With Wikipedia, we don't have to learn anything by heart, which is exactly what, what Plato was saying. So again, the parallel between the, this criticism on Wikipedia and Plato's criticism on writing always reminds us of this big, simple idea that maybe the remedy is also the, the poison. And this is why every technologist and every, everyone involved into technology should think twice about this uh, famous idea of the neutrality of technology. So a small word. Uh, Summarizing what I'm saying is that freedom without consciousness is useless, and consciousness without freedom is powerless. We have to go both ways, always. And you cannot really be an activist if you just go in the technology side, which is something that we already know. But the more history we read, the more uh, uh, powerful this idea uh, becomes. So what can we do? So we can do. Yeah, as a parenthesis, there are two ways of classifying philosophers. The first way, you can distinguish those who pretend to start from scratch and say, OK, I'm the beginning. I will rethink everything. I will forget all the books and rethink everything. This is Descartes, for example. And those who say, OK, philosophy is a, has a history, and I, I've been, I, I need to be faithful to my master. And my master is Plato, and I'm just Aristotle. I will unfold all these ideas. And uh, another uh, classification is about the human nature. Very simply, you can distinguish philosophers who say, there is a human nature. And those who say, no, there isn't. And all these two th things 
uh, changes the way uh, uh, about uh, how to read them and whether they want to spread some ideology or not and if this is and, and how they do it. Five trends before going to the tool list. Um, our device are less and less hackable. Okay, your, your computer is more and more like your mobile, but your mobile is more and more close. The IT is switching costs. So the switching cost is the cost of uh, switching from, for example, one operating system to another, one computer to another, one account to another, one network to another. All the switching costs are uh, higher and higher. You know, when you start using Google, you can switch three months after that. It's going to be that difficult. But if you wait for three years, it's going to be difficult. And, and companies are pushing into that direction so that the switching costs are higher and higher. And no matter if we are working to have more interoper interoper interoperability, it will uh, be some economical strain going that direction. States and governments are putting more and more regulation. And this is what is more apparent into activism, is that fighting bad regulation. But the, the train is very strong, more and more regulation, and on various topics that were not tackled before. And the same goes for activism, more and more diverse. And the second thing is that more and more heroes. I have mixed feelings about heroes, like in this, uh, this for for one thing, it helps thinking about what we should do because they are doing great stuff, like uh, Snowden and Assange. At uh, the same time, it feels like we are delegating stuff to them. We should not. So here's a, a small suggestion of what we could do for the next 10 years. Fight online distraction, because these distractions helps the ideology of you know, neutral technology and, uh, and uh, everything that is new and, and, and stuff like that just being controlled by the system instead of controlling the system. Start doing the history of activism, writing your own history, because the, the stuff I've been presenting and this book that I have here about, you know, from counterculture to cyberculture, this is the first step into writing this history of activism. But we also need to uh, write the recent history to understand where it goes, what are the actors, and so on. Write the history of computer science, there was a recent article about Donald Knut being very angry at, at, at or incapacity of writing the history of computer science. Who has been having a, a course in, in history of computer science? Okay, so the thing is in mathematics, you have a strong disciplinary scientific field of the history of mathematics because you have many mathematicians willing to write this history. But in computer science, we have very few uh, computer scientists willing to write this history of computer science. We have people like Donald Knut, of course, he's the, uh, the genius who started so many things that just his biography is a piece of the history of computer science. But because of the funding and because uh, of the difficulty to, fill, to, to, to fund interdisciplinary stuff in the universities, this field is uh, still too fragile. We start to have history of software, but this is different than history of computer science, and this is different than the history of uh, activism. We need to build a free search engine, and you volunteer. Okay, good. I just want to have one volunteer for every task in this list. We need to build, uh, to, ha to organize hackathons all over the world, starting in Madrid. Who wants to, to work with me and organize some uh, nice gathering of 100 people giving not their money? Two volunteers, good. If I have two, I'm very happy. <coughs> so we need to connect the social economy and free software because we don't want all this new social economy uh, trend to just use proprietary uh, computers. So who wants to work in this? Who is part of the social economy? Now you are already on some task. No, anyone? Yeah. OK, I have one volunteer. And uh, we need to connect crowdfunding and free software. There is already a project. It's called Libre Funding. You just need to join. You can write blog entries. You can experiment with crowdfunding and free software. We can do uh, surveys of users, of, of developers, if they need crowdfunding. So who would like to work on this? <coughs> who is interested in crowdfunding? Nobody ever used crowdfunding? Did you ever use crowdfunding? 
Nobody? So you're sleeping and you're dead, I know. We need to teach computer science in schools. Who wants to program Java for the rest of his life and uh, win a lot of money? And who wants to be a teacher in, in, in primary school and win very low money but uh, do something useful for children? Yeah, many people, cool, at least three. There is a huge debate about this, and I think this is really important because of the next point. The next point is to encourage social diversity in computer science. We don't have social diversity in computer science. We don't have it in Wikipedia. We don't have it in free software, and it's bad. When you think about the, 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 the story I told about new left and new communalism, new communalism, there is a part of the failure is that many, community, many communities were just very conservative about what women should do. You know, it's not because you take LSD and you have uh, free sex that you're more mature about the, 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 what women should do and should not. Many people say, yeah, it's extraordinary that in these experiments, women cooking, it's like real empowerment of women. Well, I don't think, and, and, and these communities were also uh, in majority with white, educated, wealthy uh, men. So there is a problem, okay? And we should not repeat this problem. We should work both into you know, the artistic side and, and, and also the social the criticism and the new left and, and the traditional way of fighting. And, and uh, having computer science in schools is the best way uh, to expose, uh, to have a large uh, number of, of girls exposed to computing and to think, yeah, this is what I want to do. For me, this is really the only way. Enforce legal protection of personal data because we don't even know what is your personal data that, that computer companies have. Enforce interoper interoperability to lower the switching cost. So this is what we've been doing in free software in general, but we have this, this, this problem of switching cost everywhere and we should work on that. Consider privacy as a common good. There is also, so I said, the myth of tech, tech neutrality, the myth of constant revolution, and there is this myth also that privacy is just uh, the concern of individuals. It is not. As long as you are using a mailing list, the privacy of it, everyone is responsible for the privacy of, of each other, not sharing stuff from others. So my privacy is in, in the hands of everyone. It's just in, in my hands, and I could decide, okay, I don't care about this, I care about this. No, it's in the hands of everyone, and this is counterintuitive, and we need to work on that. Protect online anonymity and fight for net neutrality. So this is, each time you do something, somehow you could put your actions into one item or another. So thank you very much, and uh, feel free to ask questions and to go deeper into parts of the history or, or whatever. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, I have the pictures. So, for example, this is Douglas Engelbart doing the mother of all demos. This is a fly of a cuckoo's nest. Remember Jack Nicholson and the Indian? And uh, all this uh, new communalism was really inspired by American Indians and movement there. And the trick in this film is that the Indian is mute and finally he knows how to speak. And this is uh, Matthew Crawford repairing motorcycles instead of earning lots of money in think tanks. Uh, this is a design pattern. So, uh, software that you know already, <coughs> Lady Lovelass, Emacs, and uh, my baby. <laughs> and the sketchpad. Okay, my baby is more important, but the sketchpad too. This is Mario's uh, Save You, 64, and the Berkeley speech about we have to fight the machines. And this is the Memex, like the idea of some kind of device that would give access to all the knowledge in the world. And this is 45, so see? I, I see two iPads on the, on the decks. This is just amazing. And this is a Dyna book as uh, uh, drawn by Alan Kay in 68 and uh, Robert Piercic book about the Zen and the art of uh, motorcycle. And the Wall Earth Catalog. So this is the one from, uh, oops, sorry. This is the one from 68, I guess. But 
it started the name Wool Earth is because in 65, Steve Brown thought, we don't have any picture of the, of the Earth viewed from the space. We don't have that picture. So he started a campaign to force the, N, uh, the NASA to take this picture and to send it to the world because he thought this is the way we're going to realize that we are all together in the same planet. And I don't know for you, but for me, it has been something important, like to realize that we are all in the same planet. Of course, seeing this, I can realize it now. This is the uh, one laptop per child computer. And I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you again. Preguntas, por favor. Um, okay. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for the conference. It was uh, really great. Uh, my question is about uh, Aaron Swartz. As you may know, it has been uh, a little bit more than two years since he's dead. You talk about uh, open access and heroes. So I would like to hear what's your opinion on, uh, well, a bit brief of what you think about it, and especially if you think that the situation now is better than two years before, and if you think people are more aware or less aware of the same. Okay. <clears throat> I thought you were talking about Alan Watts, <laughs> which is another famous American figure, and he's famous for bringing Buddhism and Zen into uh, in the 30s and 40s, and, and which was inspiring for people, uh, uh, for the beat generation and all that stuff, and later on for the virtual communities and so on. But Aaron Svartz, okay. Uh, first of all, it's very sad. I've seen the documentaries of, and I've been crying. And uh, maybe I've been crying because I feel like uh, uh, he's a sibling, you know, someone uh, we are sharing the same white male educated fighting background. So it could, could have been me, especially because I've, seen, I've, see, I've been seeing the movie exactly during my burnout. So I was like completely depressed about life, about being broken by everything and thought, okay, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and I really think he didn't want to be a hero. I mean, he, he just wanted to do some stuff. And uh, he was a hero because, because uh, everyone suddenly realized how important was uh, what he did. And uh, whether things are, are better or worse, I think they are better because more people know him and more people know his work. And uh, you can go on the web and, and, and read all the, all the uh, Aaron Svart's uh, archives. And they are very, very interesting. And also the trial and the documentary is good for that. The trial is so unfair that the state has and, and the, the U.S. state has a responsibility and it has to acknowledge it. You know, there is another case for unfair trial is, is Alan Turing, okay? And there is no need to say that, uh, that apologies are just uh, makes everyone angry. There should be no apologies. That should be the right reaction in the first place. So, I think it's good because we can see the trial is so unfair. It's good because we know more of his work. It's good because uh, uh, one of the motto of Aaron was uh, say yes to everything. And when you see what I've been doing, it's just because I was young and I was saying yes to everything. Yeah, yeah, and, and especially to Samer. Uh, do this. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do this. Yeah, but I still I will do this. Okay? And Aaron was were like, yeah, say yes to everything. It will come something will, will, will be good out of that. Behind that, there is also the question of uh, civilian uh, disobedience, whether we should do it or not. And for this, um, I, I don't have any strong opinion. I, I kind of respect uh, Socrates' stand, who says, no, you shouldn't use civilian disobedience. Because if you use this, you have no respect for the laws that you need to respect afterwards. And the laws is before you and it's after you. And if you, if you break the law, you will have no legitimacy to install new laws. 
and my death as a philosopher will be uh, the guarantee that the law is more powerful than human beings. And there is the other side where human beings are more uh, important than the laws, and that because of this principle, they should be allowed to break it sometime, somehow. And this is not to say that he has breaking the law, which is, which is the real point of the unfairness of the, of the process. So it's really sad. It changed the world in a positive way, sadly. Thank you. Preguntas? Podéis hacerlas en castellano y yo puedo traducir. You briefly mentioned in the activist uh, to-do list in point nine that uh, a hacktivist should encourage social diversity in computer science, and that has mainly to do with the lack of females in computer science. So do you think that's uh, an inherent fault of computer science, or that it's just a social stigma that we can remove? Um, I don't know, but I'm sure we don't need to answer this to change it. So I don't know if it's something that is limited to the field of computers or, or technical or science in general, but I know <coughs> that, we, uh, that we can change it. Uh, and although I was not just talking about the, the, the female and male ratio. I was also talking about the uh, ethnic diversity, background di diversity. And this is also very, very uh, important. And I have this feeling that there is some kind of uh, hypocrisy behind the official discourse. The official discourse is like, we like scientists. We should do more stuff to promote scientists. But I'm not sure this is a, they, they really want to have more scientists, because when you see, at least in France, uh, the state and all the administration, this is led by people who've been doing uh, literature, like our philosophy, our humanities. They do humanities, and at some point, they either become some dead writer or some journalist or some political b guy who think in terms of what I, should I change, speaking, and so on. And the scientists are not that present, so we say we need more scientists, but at the same time, I'm not sure we really encourage science in, in, in school, which would be the, the, the only thing to do for, our, for having more diversity. So I'm not sure it answers your question, but... Partly. Partly. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know about the, the figures. I know, for example, just one, one, one figure is <clears throat> about teaching computer science in school. Maybe you've heard about the code week. So it was in October, it was big, and uh, it was really nice to have 3,000 events during one week in October about coding in school, and all over Europe, okay? And uh, Spain was uh, very active. I think there was 100 events, some in Madrid. I met the guy who led the events uh, in Madrid. And the ratio female-male in, 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 in coding is very, very unfair for females, but the ratio for people who were organizing the code week, we had more females. We had more uh, girls joining this movement of uh, having workshops for, for teaching kids. So if you're conservative, you will say, of course, this is because girls are, 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 more, you know, are more willing to interact with kids. Or if you are like me, you feel like, okay, maybe they, have, they are more conscious that this is the only way to have more diversity. And they just want to be part of this because of that, not just because they like kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of changing stuff. Okay, thank you. And also one thing is that, why is, this, is it in this list? <laughs> so it's not... In the hacktivist list, why about this social diversity and female stuff? This is because it opens up uh, our reasons. I mean, if hacktivism is all about using technology to change the society and, uh, and the political environment, then the more diverse this, the, 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 the tribe of, of uh, hacktivists, then the, the more chances you have to do the right thing. Uh, just, just about this. 
so the question is when uh, the basic programming language uh, they say that basic was butchering the the computer science so uh, how should we teach children programming the basic way or more as a science okay uh, <clears throat> I see two questions or I will <laughs> decide there there is two there are two questions uh, one question is uh, uh, and that is a question very very uh, famous right now is do we have visual interfaces for teaching programming that are better than basic which was not visual at all so this is this is uh, the debate about Seymour Papert logo and all that stuff and scratch and uh, e-toys all these environments that are very visual the question is are they better to teach programming than the old ba uh, basic that we had my experience would say that basic was good and uh, I think it was good because it was linear. So you took a program and you were able to read it from beginning to end. And even the weird go to 20 has some cognitive uh, effect that is good because it's like you know, a novel from which you are the hero. Remember these novels? You could read and, and you decide, go to this place. And you turn the pages and you go to this place and it's, okay. It was very famous when I was young. And, and, and the bas basic program is like that. So it's very easy to read, to remember, and it's easy to understand what it does at first glance. Now when everything is modular, you have to navigate through a maze of modules and it's hard to, to understand the global uh, function, functionality. So basic was good for that. And visual interfaces now are good for lowering the, the threshold. Even if you're not at ease with reading and with uh, uh, textual information, you can start doing some stuff. So it's more fun, it's more rewarding for the, for the stuff they are doing. So, so I don't have a definite answer on this, but I kind of, I'm kind of nostalgic about uh, BASIC because it was linear and because you could read it in your bed. Like, <laughs> who is reading programs in his bed uh, nowadays? I mean, without a computer. And when you had reviews, uh, paper reviews, you could read programs. And that, I think that was great. I, I, uh, I'm nostalgic. So this is the first question, visual uh, interaction versus uh, basic as a textual uh, program. And the other question is uh, basic versus computer science. Uh, I think we should teach both computer science and programming. And in France, there is a bias that programming is just too easy to be taught, okay? Slaves could do programming because this is just interpreting. Either, ideally, we could have a machine do the programming if we can find the right language to tell the machine what we want to do. So the only problem is that to find this language is programming, okay? So, there is this, this frame uh, of mine, and it's because uh, mathematicians are very strong in France, so they kind of despise the small hands that are doing the, the conversion. And uh, so I'm really pushing so that programming is, uh, is uh, seen as something uh, as high profile as computer science, because computer science inherits the, the, the aura from mathematics, so that, that's good, and that's why people want to teach it. But I think we, we need to go further and, and really think that doing hands-on stuff with computers is teaching something for real. This is not just uh, interpretation. And, and, and in France, we have really this problem that people do, uh, in, engineers, when they are good enough, they stop programming and they do management. Okay? I don't know if you have the same in, 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 in Spain, but this is stupid. If you're good enough to program, you should program more. And you should teach more about what you've been inventing in programming. And if you're good in managing, yeah, then you should manage. But the high school that we have in France, they despise programming for that because they say, OK, there are so many people who want to program, and it's just uh, something for nerds that are eating pizzas and listening uh, Metallica. Okay. <laughs> Which is also something I wanted to say. We, had to f we have to fight 
this, you know, this pop culture of bro grammar, of being cool, okay? Sorry to, to, to spoil the party, but uh, being cool is cool in between 20 and 25. But after that, you have to read history to make kids and to earn a living. <laughs> so I'm not cool. Someone's cool, want to ask a question, go ahead. I'm cool enough. Mi pregunta es, ¿por qué en, durante la charla has estado diciendo que Ponía, ponía el ejemplo de qué quieres, eh, trabajar para una gran empresa o, o enseñar, sobre todo en el punto 8, ganar poco dinero enseñando. Pues no se debería... You were saying in the point 8 about teaching, you were comparing working on a big uh, company, programming all your life and whatever and earning money versus earning little money and teaching. Yeah. Uh, continue. No debería fomentarse que este tipo de cosas en general el enseñar que se valora muy poco aquí se te produzca más dinero y si para llegar a ser esa lista hay que ganar poco dinero de dónde sacas el dinero. Um, he's saying something very interesting <laughs> that would be that uh, shouldn't we promote and encourage that those that are teaching or that are trying to fill up this list should be actually the ones earning loads of money. <laughs> uh, because if that's not the situation, how are we going to get the money in order to fill up this list? Say again the, the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll just... Okay, the idea, that what, what he's saying is yeah. that you put in comparison to working this list, for example, in teaching computer science in schools, Yeah versus working in a large corporation, programming Java for the rest of your life, yeah, and yeah, earning yeah. loads of money. What he's saying is that shouldn't we encourage, I mean, sh uh, sh shouldn't we facilitate that in some way, people that are fulfilling this list, doing the tasks in this list, yeah. are, are earning a lot of money, because if that's not the situation, how are we gonna do yeah, it yeah, yeah. without the Yeah, yeah, okay, great, thanks. Uh, I'm still alive. <laughs> I've been through the burnout, and I'm alive, and I can buy uh, food to my baby. She's, uh, she's two years old now. So, uh, Wikimedia Foundation, what, you, what is amazing is that the donations are very small. Like, they are, the, the, the average donation uh, when they are doing the campaign is $30, meaning that many, many people are giving. Of course, because many people are exposed to Wikipedia. And in the software industry, we have lots of open source companies. But this ecosystem is not, uh, is, they are just big players. They are big players on one side and people starving on the other side. Like even the budget from the Free Software Foundation is just one day of fundraising in, in, in Wikipedia. This is stupid and they are not even trying to, managing to do it. So I'm saying this to explain why uh, uh, we designed the Hackathon. The Hackathon ID was like, we need to put more diversity and, and we need to support financially small free software or free project initiatives. Because we need to fight against this culture of I am 21 years old, I have some time, I'm a student so I can hack for free because I don't have any, any economic constraints versus, uh, versus uh, <clears throat> yeah, we need to give more, more financial power to small projects and we need to come closer to a model uh, a, la, a la Wikimedia Foundation where we have many supporters. This because of the illusion of, uh, uh, of um, uh, gratis. Okay. Well, uh, because everything is, is gratis doesn't mean we don't need to pay for creating it. So we pay by your time and so on and so on. But we need to, to change the economy from open source, big companies um, getting paid because they are, uh, they are uh, uh, working with big clients. And sometimes I was like, okay, I'm, I'm spending three hours a day and, and my program is using all the developers in Google. 
and I don't, and I, I don't earn money. So this whole feeling should change so that everyone is in charge. As a consumer, you are in charge every day because you don't want to give five euros to Starbucks and you prefer to go to Cafe Lito. Okay? Because you prefer the people from Cafe Lito. You vote with your, with your wallet. Okay? This is voting with your wallet. Today, we vote with our attention and time. And this is invisible, so we don't feel like voting. So the idea behind the hackathon is voting with the wallet of people who have some money, because I don't. And the more we can do this, uh, it's a, it's, we, maybe we can leverage and change uh, the, 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 the economy. It's not going to be a big change, but at least psychologically, it helps developers thinking, yeah, I could ask money for what I'm doing. Or it could help uh, activists saying, yeah, I could ask money for what I'm doing. And actually, this is how Steve Brand uh, uh, was making a, a success. He was a genius of building bridges and doing money with his new ideas, like the earth, the ideas of having a, pictures, uh, a picture of the earth. He's starting to print badges and to sell badges. You know, the same way Richard Stallman starting, started to sell Emacs first because he needed money for the GNU project. So we need to encourage this kind of hybrid uh, project that are economically sustainable and going to the right uh, direction. I completely agree. And for example, for teaching uh, coding, there are, uh, there are at least five or six uh, companies in France who ask money to the parents so, so that the children go in, in, in the holidays and learn teaching in the holidays, which goes in the right direction because some teachers are interested and think, okay, I could do this in my school. And it creates an ecosystem where uh, the government will have some handbooks because they want handbooks. And those small companies will write the, the handbooks. So it's, uh, it's possible. It's hard, but it's possible. And we shouldn't think that the, f the, the, the free everything that we have on the internet will help us. It doesn't help, no. The question is, would you like to pay a bit each year to have Wikipedia? And the answer is yes, for many people. Would you like to pay for having a, a GNU Linux, for having Ubuntu, for having all the software? And the answer is not yes, for now. 